So we just want to say that if you are checking this out for the first time or if you're watching this online for the first time and you do not have a home church, then we want to say to you, welcome home. All right. Well, we are going to be uh, all over the scriptures today. So if you want to go ahead and take out your Bibles, maybe you're fast enough. If not, we'll have the scriptures on the screen behind us. Uh, but today we are wrapping up our series, If Only, where over the last several weeks, we've been kind of taking a step back to see where or what our souls are truly aligned with and where in, li where in our lives we need to make some adjustments. We've been looking at some of those things in our lives that we believe will make our lives better. It could very well be kind of the driving force behind uh, some of the things that we do in our life, living the way that we do behind some of the motives uh, in our decision making. And to be honest, over the last few weeks, it's been pretty sobering, hasn't it? We've acknowledged that uh, all of us were, are born with sort of a vacuum, kind of a hole in our souls that can't be filled or satisfied long term with anything other than the presence of Jesus in our lives, his will for us, his way for us. We can try to fill it with relationships. We can try to fill it with possessions. We can try to fill it with pleasure. We can try to fill it with success or knowledge, but none of those things will last long term. Eventually, all of those things will cease to exist. And then we're left wanting and craving and kind of desiring more because those things are never enough. But I want to proclaim to you and suggest to you today that Jesus is enough. Remember the words of the apostle, uh, of, of the words from Jesus to the apostle Paul when he was desperately, Paul was desperately seeking a solution to a problem that he was dealing with. And so in 2 Corinthians, Jesus said this to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you know what the word sufficient means? It means enough. It means adequate. So Jesus was telling Paul the same thing that he wants us to know today and that his grace is enough for you that his grace is adequate for you, that his grace is sufficient for you, that his grace is all we need, that Jesus is indeed enough for us today. So I'm gonna close out this series by talking about one last if only that I believe kind of cripples some of us from really moving forward in life. Something that keeps us from pursuing and chasing Jesus the way that we should because of some shame that we carry around, because of some guilt that we regularly deal with and even carry in our lives from season after season after season. And it's this, if only I had a perfect past. If only I had a perfect past. How many of you in here have a perfect past? Come on, there's gotta be someone that's got a perfect past. Oh, oh, okay, there we go. I knew we'd have at least one that has a perfect past. Yeah, me either. How many of you have done some really dumb and stupid mistakes in your life. There, there we go. Where's, where are all my real Christians today? Okay. Yeah. If only I didn't date him or her. If only I didn't go through that traumatic experience, whether it's abuse or divorce or an accident. If only I would have listened to their advice and not made that mistake. If only I didn't have all of those years of addiction. If only I would have turned left in my, in my life instead of right. Then where would I be? What could I have done? Who would I be with? Or what would my life look like if only? And then we're left dealing with those regrets and that shame and that guilt. And then we get on social media or whatever our vice is, whatever our addiction is to, to numb the emotion or the feeling from which we're trying to escape only to go down the road of comparison that leads to depression and isolation and loneliness. And that's exactly where Satan wants to keep us. And then before you know it, we're paralyzed once again by our past to think that we're not valuable, to think that we're not worth anything, to think that we're not seen. I remember one of the first times that someone asked me to speak to a group of teens after I'd surrendered my life over to Jesus. And I remember they said, hey, will you speak to the youth group on Wednesday? I'm like, me? I, I was still traumatized by things that I'd done a year prior to that. I, I, I froze up. I couldn't believe it. How, how dare they ask me? I was still carrying around so much guilt and shame from things I'd done just a, a year earlier, and I felt as if God could never use me. 
things and people from my past that haunted me on a daily reminder of where I came from, the things that I had done, and I was desperately trying to leave that behind to pursue a life of Jesus to the point where I just felt like the only thing worthy enough for me to do is just to show up on Sundays. I can't do anything else. God can never use me. But God had a much bigger plan. And you're stuck with me, all right, for, for the next few, few years. But he had a much bigger plan for me just like he does for you. So here's the big idea I want to stay connected to this morning. It's this. God doesn't see us through the lens of our past mistakes, but through the lens of his grace. God does not see us through the lens of our past mistakes, but through the lens of his grace. Remember what, what we say here a lot at New Life, that nothing is wasted. Your past didn't make you, so your past cannot define you. We have to stop letting our past to, uh, stop allowing it to label us. The mirror that we should be holding up to ourselves to see who we really are is the mirror that God holds up to us to say, we, you, you and I were created in his image, not the image of our mistakes. If you're a follower of Jesus today, meaning that you've done what the Apostle Paul says, okay, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, meaning that, that you've done what Romans 10, 9 says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, meaning that you confess that with your mouth, and that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the formula. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you will be saved. And if you've made that declaration of faith, then God has forgiven you of your past. I want you to hear that from me this morning. And it's time to move forward. King David said this in Psalm 103. He has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. Look what Micah says in chapter seven. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. One translation says into the sea of forgetfulness. Can God remember your past? Absolutely. He's God but I believe he chooses not to. Your friends and your family, they may not be so forgiving of your past, but God is. I heard a story one time of a couple. Uh, the, the wife was talking to one of her friends and she said, my husband and I, we never fight fair. Every time we get in an argument, we always get historical. And the, one, and the friend said, don't you mean hysterical? She said, no, I mean historical because we always bring up each other's past. I think some of us have a hard time believing that about God, that God doesn't do that, that God doesn't get historical on us, that he doesn't bring up our past mistakes, that he truly does forgive us of our past, that he truly does forgive us of our sins. And because it's hard for some of us to believe, we carry our past behind us like these heavy suitcases, just dragging them around from season to to season. We take them everywhere we go, just lugging them around, reminding us of all the wrong choices that we made, reminding us of all the mistakes that we made. And those things will hijack God's best for you. And here's what happens if we don't learn to put these down. If we aren't able to truly let go of our past and accept that God's grace and accept that God's forgiveness and that his freedom is indeed enough, that his grace is sufficient for us, we will carry these suitcases around from relationship, from relationship to relationship, from job to job, from season to season, and from generation to generation. We will pass that on to our children. In the Bible, we, we read story after story of people who had far from a perfect past, but yet God was still able to use them in amazing ways. Moses had a speech impediment, tons of insecurities. He murdered an Egyptian soldier, which is why he left Egypt in the first place. David was an adulterer and also a murderer. Jacob was a liar and a deceiver. Joseph was abused. Gideon was a coward. Rahab was a prostitute. The Samaritan woman had been married five times and was currently living with another man when Jesus approached her. Peter denied Jesus. We could go on and on. And nearly every single one of those individuals brought up their past. They brought up their luggage to God as to why they were unworthy to be used by him. And yet their story, their story of redemption, their story of restoration 
can be your story as well. Because even though that they all had an imperfect past, God still was able to advance his kingdom through them, advance his will and his way and his plan through them. You think, well, how do we do that? How do we just drop these? Or how, how do we get past our past and be effective for God's kingdom here on earth? We're gonna talk about three prayers this morning. We always give three different fill-ins. Today, they're called three different prayers. So we have three prayers that we can focus on this week. So write these down, put these on your refrigerator, put them in your Bible, put them somewhere where you can see them because I believe that these prayers can be effective in helping us let go of our past. Of our past. Prayer number one says this, surrender God, help me to surrender the imperfections of my past. God, help me to surrender the imperfections of my past. Did you know it's okay to acknowledge you're not perfect? It's okay to acknowledge that we've messed up. I mean, it's one of the things that we do the very first time that we come to Jesus and invite him into our lives and and make that declaration that we wanna be a follower of his, right? We, We pray, Jesus, I'm a sinner, I've messed up, I want you to be my Lord, I'm making a commitment today to follow you and your plan for my life. Now, it doesn't mean that everything in your life from that moment forward is going to be perfect or that things from your past aren't going to every now and then kind of creep back into your life, but what we're doing is we're confessing that Jesus is greater than me. And that we don't want to live without him moving forward. That we want to live a past of living without him to a present and a future with him. And listen, we are constantly going to be battling through our imperfections. All the time, all of our life. Becoming a follower of Jesus doesn't automatically erase the past from our minds. But it does position us. In a, it, it does position us to where we can say, in spite of my imperfections, in spite of my flaws, in spite of my, of my failures, God still loves me. And God has a plan for me and that he cares for me and that God can still use me. We talked about Moses just a couple of minutes ago. In Exodus chapter four is when God first shows up on the scene to say, hey, I want you to go back to Egypt and deliver my one million plus people out of slavery. Now, Moses is 80 years old at this point. So he's thinking, okay, I'm not your guy. I'm old. Uh, 40 years ago, I was there and I murdered someone. I, I have a speech impediment. I don't speak very, very well, especially under stress. I don't do well. I'm not your guy. And so they're having this conversation. Let's pick it up in verse 10 of Exodus 4. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord said to Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? It is I, the Lord. Now go, and I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. This was just one of the imperfections that Moses felt like he needed to remind God of why he cannot be used. Not to mention all the other things that should have disqualified him in that moment. But in spite of all of his imperfections, God still had a plan for him. God still wanted to use him to fulfill a promise that he made to the Jewish people centuries earlier. And he wants to do the same with you. No matter your past, Regardless of what you've gone through, regardless of your past, regardless of your imperfections, regardless of your failures, regardless of your flaws, God still has a plan for you. Yes, God knows you've been in prison. Yes, God knows who hurt you. Yes, God knows that you've been divorced or God knows that you're still triggered by your addiction. Yes, God knows about the abuse and the trauma that you either went through or that you caused. He knows all about that. And in spite of all your imperfections, God can still use you for his glory. We have to stop thinking, if only I had a perfect past, then God could use me, because no one does. It's time for all of us today to put down our luggage, and begin to walk in the freedom and the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus has already given us. We just have to truly accept that. Now, maybe you're here today and your luggage 
the luggage from your past wasn't caused by you. You were the victim. You had nothing to do with it. I mean, you're sitting there saying, Jeremy, I can't put this down because it wasn't something I did to cause it. I didn't put this luggage in my hand. I didn't put the weight of this luggage inside the suitcases, but I'm left with it. What do I do? You didn't want your spouse to leave, but now you're left carrying the luggage. You didn't ask to be abused, whether it's mental or physical or sexually, but you were, and now you're the one that's left carrying the luggage. You didn't ask for the trauma that you wake up thinking about every single morning, but you're still left carrying the luggage. Jeremy, what do I do with that? Or maybe the person who stuffed your suitcases are no longer around. Maybe they just moved on with their life or they moved out of state or maybe they're, they passed on. Maybe they're not even alive anymore. And now you're never going to hear those words, I'm sorry, or please forgive me, or I know I caused this harm to you. I know I am the one that wounded you. You're never going to get that restoration or the forgiveness that you feel like you need from this person. And let me just say, if that's part of your story, as your pastor, I am deeply, deeply sorry that that, that, that happened to you. I'm deeply sorry that you had to go through that experience. So can I encourage you today? If that is part of your story, seek help. Get counseling. There is absolutely nothing wrong with talking with someone. We have business cards actually out in our lobby of our on-staff counselor, Ms. Marilyn, who, who loves talking with people who are going through some of these things in their life. Reach out to somebody on our team. Do not go through this alone. Do not go through this by yourself. Remember what we say around here, that nothing is wasted. So prayer number one, God, help me to surrender the imperfections of my past. Prayer number two is this, God, help me to move forward with hope. Help me to move forward with hope. Proverbs chapter four, look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. One of the hardest things to ever do is to let go of a, of a hurtful or unhealthy past. One of the hardest things to ever do is to not allow the regret and the guilt and the shame or even words to hijack the peace and the joy that's offered to you by Jesus. Maybe you suffer from one of the same challenges that I do, which is the ability to go all the way back to even when I was a little kid and remember nearly every negative word, every negative thing that's ever been said to me or over me. And can I tell you, I hate that I can do that. It is a curse. I do not like that in my life. But whenever I think back about things that were said to me that really damaged me, that hurt me, that wounded me, the smells, the clothing, the location, the tone of their voice, I can tell you everything about it. I hate that I can do that. Whether it's from family members, whether it's from friends I went to school with or bosses I worked under or peers that I worked alongside, but let me tell you this, the longer, this is what I realized, the longer I allowed their words and their actions to control and define me, the longer it took me to find my identity in Jesus. The longer I looked into the mirror that they were holding up instead of the one that Christ holds up to me, the longer it took for me to see myself the way God sees me. And God wants us to move forward, not backward not to be paralyzed by, by our past, to be, but to be present in his presence. I finally had to say to myself, wait, I'm dwelling on the past and allowing it to keep me from what God is trying to do in my present. This was a major learning for me while I was on sabbatical last year. And then I remembered what God said to the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. He was reminding them, he was speaking to the nation of Israel and he was speaking through the prophet Isaiah and he was reminding them of all these amazing miracles that he had done in the past. Remember when I did this, remember when I did this, remember when I did that. And then he says this in chapter 43 of Isaiah, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do for I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? The second week, of my sabbatical, I can remember sitting out in that hotel room 
It was midnight. It was dark. I was watching the ocean. Janet was already fast asleep. It was just some me and Jesus time out there in the balcony. And I just clearly heard this whisper say to me, quit dwelling on the past because you're missing the joy of the present. That was, that was revelatory for me. Jeremy, stop dwelling on the past because you're missing the joy of the present. Either with him or my family. I was so consumed with, what things, with how things used to look like that I couldn't move forward and enjoy what was happening right in front of me. Listen, God is present tense. God is the great I am, not the great I was. Let me encourage you to put your hope in him and move forward. Forget about your past. Your past isn't perfect and neither are you. God wants to do a new thing in your life and he wants you to put down the luggage in order to move forward because what you're carrying, let's face it, is too heavy for you anyway. You may be thinking, but Jeremy, how do I do that? How can I just escape? To, how do I just drop my past? I mean, how do I just accept the fact that the past is what it is? I can't do anything about it and just move forward. I mean, my past is part of me. You're exactly right. Your past will always be a part of you. It's how you got here today. Well, I believe first, in order to move forward, it starts up here. It starts in our thoughts. We have to be intentional about having a renewed mind to say, my past is no longer me. That is no longer my attitude. That is no longer my behavior. That is no longer the way I live my life. To personalize what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So personalize that by saying, I now belong to Jesus Christ and I am a new person. My old life is gone. My new life has begun. I'm not going to sit around and disqualify myself from being used by God because of my past. What's done is done. I can't change it. It's not perfect. And I'm not going to dwell on it any longer. We have to be that determined. It begins in our mind and it begins with our attitude. Every time the enemy, your enemy, Satan, we are not each other's enemy, by the way. Every time Satan begins to taunt you and remind you of your past with things like, remember when you did this? Remember when you said that? Remember, remember that one time? Remember how you used to respond? Remember how you used to react? Focus on what the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian church. Look at this, Philippians chapter four. Fix your thoughts on what is true, not lies, on what is true and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Man, who doesn't want more peace in their life? People that drag around their, their past are consumed by the opposite of peace, anxiety, worry, then the God of peace will be with you. Ask God to, re to renew your mind daily and move forward with his hope in your life. We have to drop the luggage and move forward. So that's prayer number two. Prayer number three is this. God, help me to focus on the future you have for me. Help me to focus on the future that you have for me. Philippians chapter three says this. Forgetting the past and looking forward, this is the apostle Paul, to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me. Listen, your past is designed to keep you there. You, to hold you hostage to who you used to be. Your old identity is what your past wants to hold you back into. But if you press forward, God has already prepared your future. God has already prepared your reward. The Apostle Paul had to release his past identity of Saul, the persecutor of Christians, so that he could move forward in the ministry to which God was calling him. When we become followers of Jesus, we no longer identify with the devil. We no longer identify with the plans of Satan, but with Jesus, our Savior. We get to change camps on the God's team when we become a follower of Jesus. 
And forgetting our past enables us to move forward into God's plan and freedom for us. So what have we learned here today so far? Okay, number one, that we've learned to confess and surrender the imperfections of our past. Number two, we've learned to renew our minds and thoughts by dwelling on the things of God and not on the things that hold us back. And since we've done those two things, now what do we do? We move forward. We walk in the freedom and the grace and the purpose and the promise that God, has, that God has planned for us. We have to walk into those things. So my question to all of us is, if you've done those things, if, you, if you're able to surrender the imperfections of your past, if you're able to move forward, if you're able to focus on the future that God has for you, what is God calling you to? What is God calling you to? What is he inviting you towards? If you're leaving behind your past, which means you're moving in a direction away from your past, what is God inviting you to? What does that look like for you? Because that's really between you and God. Maybe God wants to use something that you've learned from your past to help others. Maybe you see yourself in someone else. Maybe you can use your experience to help them because of something that you've gone through. It could be celebrate recovery. It could be divorce care or grief share, a financial class, helping teens not to make the wrong choices that you made. (laughs) What is it? Or maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what, Jeremy? I'm, I'm nowhere near there. I mean, my past happened a long time ago and I do carry some things from my past that I, that I know I, I need to drop but my past is still way too fresh. I'm young or this just happened last week. This just happened yesterday. This just happened last year. This just happened this morning before I got here. Maybe your past is just way too fresh. Maybe your arms are still a little shaky because you just dropped your luggage. If you work out, you kind of know your arms are a little shaky. You're still in recovery mode. Maybe you're here today and what you're looking for more than anything is for restoration and for renewal from your past. Let me tell you a couple of stories here as I wrap up. I mentioned earlier about a guy named Jacob. Jacob was, uh, he was a liar. He was a deceiver. Those of you don't, that don't know the story of Jacob. So Jacob's grandpa was Abraham. Everybody's heard of Abraham, Father Abraham, right? The father of faith. So Abraham was, couldn't have children and then finally God blessed him with Isaac. And then Isaac had several kids, but uh, he had a set of twins, Jacob and Esau. So Esau came out first and then Jacob came out holding on to Esau's heel. That's how he got his name. Jacob means heel grabber. Another language, it means deceiver. And boy, did Jacob live up to that name. A couple of times in Esau's life, now Esau was kind of a, he was a, he was a daddy's man. He, he was daddy's boy. He was a man's man. He was the hunter, kind of a big, you know, kind of a bulky guy. Jacob was the mama's boy, you know. Mama really loved Jacob. Daddy really loved Esau. And so there were a couple of times, big times in Jacob's life where he deceived his brother, Esau, stole his birthright because he was the firstborn since he came out first. So the birthright belonged to him. He stole it from him. And then later in life, he actually stole Esau's blessing. He deceived his dad. His dad was old and blind and he stole Esau's blessing. So that means that everything from Abraham to Isaac now goes to Jacob instead of Esau. This infuriated Esau, so he left, took everything that he owned and left and went away and just was bitter and resentful and angry. Of course, who wouldn't be? And now Jacob's living off of his grandfather's blessing. But years go by and Jacob wants to make this right. And he says, you know what, man? I I really miss my brother. 
I love my brother and I want to make amends with him. And so he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my brother. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask forgiveness. I want to make this right with my brother because we are so close growing up and I deceived him. I shouldn't have done these things. And I'm going to go make this right with my brother. So he gathers up a ton of his belongings and he's got livestock and all these great things. And so he's going to this He's, he's going to make his way to Esau. And so he gets to this river. And so he sends everything that is starting to become nightfall. He sends everything over on the, uh, on the side of the river. On the other side of the river, he stays back on this side. So it gets dark. He says, I'm going to stay here for the night. And then I'm going to follow uh, everything tomorrow. But I want all my belongings to go to my brother before I get there. Because I'm really afraid that he might just kill me. <laughs> and so he's there that night by himself alone. And the Lord shows up. And so the Lord and Jacob wrestle. Now, I don't know how this wrestling match started, but they wrestled all night long. And finally, the Lord said to him, hey, who are you? Now, this question of him asking who he is goes way back. There's a ton of deeper theology behind this that we don't have time to get into. But he says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. And he says, from now on, your name is Israel, which we know today. And then he said, you've got to let me go. The sun's coming up. He's like, I'm not doing it. Not until you bless me. And so finally he touches Jacob's hip, and throws it out of socket. Now Jacob was 80, so it probably didn't take a whole lot. Yeah, let's face it. But he touches his hip, throws it out of socket, and then he leaves. And then Jacob, the next day, crosses the river and begins to make his way towards his brother Esau. Limping. Broken wounded, humble, disgraced, leaving his past to go to his brother. He says, I will go to my brother and I will ask for forgiveness. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you know any of the parables of Jesus, the prodigal son. Those of you that don't know that story, there's two boys their father was extremely wealthy and the younger son says, man, I don't wanna to wait till my dad dies to get my inheritance, I actually want it now. So he goes to his father and says, give me everything that belongs to me. The father did so and he went to the town, squandered everything that he had on prostitutes and wild living. His friends gathered around him, they, they, they took all of his money from him and so now he's left in a pig pen, literally in a pig pen, eating what the pigs are eating. He said, tomorrow I will rise up I will go to my father and I'm gonna ask for forgiveness. And he does, he does that, he gets up. And so he starts walking towards his father. He's dirty, he's broken, he's humble. We got Jacob over here in the Old Testament and we got this parable that Jesus is telling of the prodigal son in the New Testament. Both of them trying to leave their past behind and walking broken and humble towards forgiveness and mercy and grace. Here's something I want to point out to you. Let's look at the story of Jacob. It's in Genesis 33. It says this. Then Esau, as he's walking towards Esau, towards his brother that he's afraid of, then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him threw his arms around him and kissed him. And they both wept. Look what happened to the prodigal son. It's in Luke. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him come and filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Did you catch that? Both of these individuals are leaving their past behind them to walk towards forgiveness and grace and mercy. And the whole time, grace and forgiveness and mercy was running towards them, ready to embrace them. If you're here today, let me encourage you. Here's my challenge for you. Truly leave your past behind. Drop the heaviness of this luggage, drop it. Quit carrying your past behind you 
Because as you walk towards the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that you so desperately need, open your eyes and look because it's already running toward you. That is, that is accepting the true freedom that we have in Jesus. When you become a follower of Jesus, you are no longer bound to your past. You are free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You receive that this morning? Will you bow your heads? Father, Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our past. Thank you, Lord, that you no longer hold us accountable to our past mistakes, but you truly forgive us. Your grace and your mercy reaches so far beyond what we can even imagine to erase our past mistakes so that we can truly walk in freedom and the forgiveness that only you offer. Lord, I just pray over every single person in this room, Lord. Lord, if they are able, Lord, I pray that they will drop the luggage of their past today and truly walk out of here and walk in the freedom that you offer. That we won't be haunted or taunted by the things that we've done because that's no longer who we are. We are a new person. One translation says we are a new creature because of our surrender to you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for this entire series, if only, where we can truly focus our gaze upon you and not on the things of this world. The things of this world do not bring us pleasure long-term. All of those things fade away and we can't take it with us, but instead, our relationship with you is forever, for eternity. We thank you for that. Go with us, Lord. Go with us, Lord, and let us remember you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in this week. We hope that the message inspired or encouraged you to take at least one step closer to Jesus. Hey, if you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. It's one of the best ways to keep up with what's happening around here at New Life, or you can check out our website at newlifecc.com. If there's ever anything that you would like for us to be praying with you about, or if you'd like to support what's happening around here at New Life, you can do that as well. Hey, thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.